Uh, but thank you. My name is Revy Sterling. I direct the program in ICTD, which is Information and Communication Technology for Development. I did not come up with that terrible acronym, uh, but I did inherit it as being part of this field. What it essentially is, is using technology to address social, socio and economic divides you know, around the world, domestic, international. Um, I have a, lot of a little flyer up here I'd love for you guys to take with you in my card as well that kind of shows some of the past projects, the practicums and labs that our students have done, which include things like doing solar panel um, solar panel based computer school labs after uh, the earthquake in Haiti and doing distance health reporting and uh, malaria programming in the Amazon and um, working on community radio in places like uh, uh, Nigeria for agricultural value chains as well as doing domestic work and I'm, I'm looking at Jay and Alex and other folks on the team that have been working to track nutrition efforts in uh, Westwood a food desert in Denver so we do a lot of different projects and these students have done incredible amount of work uh, that they're going to share today. So please take a brochure and card and if you're interested in having us work on a project for you, if you want to come be a student with us, uh, it's a very inclusive, fun community. It's a fantastic, hey Kildy kids, all right. <laughs> You have to come to the program in 20 years, all right? <laughs> so, uh, but I'll stick around afterwards when we're having a little uh, uh, cupcakes to, to talk a little bit more about the program if anyone's interested. Meanwhile, uh, before we get started, I do want to introduce four people in the audience for whom this would not have been possible, and that would be our interim director, Jill Dupre, our former Atlas director, John Bennett, Vicki Stubbs, who basically runs all things, all things important, um, and then really the soul of the program, our student advisor, Rache Cohen. Definitely a round of applause. And just a little bit about the presentations you'll hear tonight. Each of the students will be giving a 15 minute presentation. We'll have five minutes for Q&A, five minutes for the person next to you to set up their computer so we just roll right into things with no AV problems because you are technical, right? You've been in this technology program. Uh, the first up will be, you don't have to get up right yet, I promise, will be Rachel Strobel, who I met actually as an undergrad in the communication department here. And we got to work together for two years on our undergrad honors thesis on the use of technology and human trafficking efforts in Colorado and Mexico. Um, and it gave me two years to woo her into the program. And now you're going to leave. No, you can never leave. That's part of the Atlas thing. Uh, Matt Hulse, who did this degree in conjunction with another master's degree in electrical and computer engineering and hasn't slept since he started that process. Uh, and Rachel Powers, who came for a visit one time just to Boulder, and we made her stay. She was such a fit and asset to the program, uh, especially with her background, that it was necessary to recruit her as a student. Um, all of these students I've gotten to work with so closely. I mean, I teach six of their 10 courses, so we've gotten to know each other very, very well over the years. And I can just say how proud I am of them. Atlas is so proud of you. Um, and I have to say, I'm a little surprised. All three talks you're going to hear tonight uh, are policy talks. They all chose to do their practicums in policy-related fields of information and communication technology for development, um, which is a first for us. But I realize all three of them had very extensive field backgrounds that already been um, in developing communities and underserved communities, Rachel working quite extensively in Mexico on her human trafficking efforts with a variety of organizations. Matt, who's been all around the world, worked in Haiti, worked in Peru. We had a chance to work on a project together. Um, and Rachel, who got to do some really exciting uh, maternal health and uh, mobile health technology uh, work in Kenya prior to uh, her practicum. And their practicums have been in such places as the World Bank, uh, United Nations um, ITU, and the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization, places that I've tried to get jobs for years and haven't, but they did. So first up, Rachel Scrobel. Okay. All right, I just want to test something out here really quick. Okay, perfect. Okay, so... Um, all right, well, first of all, my name is Rachel. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Bevy. It's an honor to be here uh, presenting to you this evening. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in because I have only 15 minutes to tell you about everything. So uh, four years ago, I begged Revy in my undergrad to get into one of her graduate level courses. One of the first things she did is she handed me this book, ICT 4D, written by Professor Tim Unwin. So this is one of the first books in the field, 
and I immediately fell in love with this field. How can you utilize technology to help developing regions, communities, and social issues? Very exciting stuff. So I kind of consider Tim Unwin as the forefather of ICTD. As he calls it, ICT 4D, and I got reprimanded about that in London. Uh, but semantics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to briefly highlight that I had a lot of field work, and so from that, I was looking at technology and how it can be utilized for counter trafficking, not human trafficking. And so um, I got to live and work with survivors down there, and that really shaped my journey into this program. Unfortunately, I can't show you their beautiful faces, but they are lovely people. <laughs> um, so because of that, I wanted to work on a policy position, figure out what's happening on the macro level. What does that look like? And the connections were right, where I was able to go to London, England, and work with Professor Tim Unwin, the Secretary Generalist for this organization. So I just want to highlight, uh, we focus on six specific areas within the Commonwealth, mobile broadband, cyber security, ICTs and disabilities, um, skills development, capacity training, regulation, and youth and ICT. So before I dive into the details about the CTO, which I'll just say that for short because it's pretty long to say, but CTO is, uh, I first need to talk about the Commonwealth. So this is something that a lot of Americans struggle with grasping because we aren't part of the Commonwealth. Um, but the Commonwealth is a network of countries that was the former British Empire, which used to be one fourth of the world. Now it's roughly a third of the world's population. Um, and it comprises about 16% of the world's GDP. So if you think about the European Union, there's a, you know, a common network there for financial concerns, and also you can easily um, work within the European Union. It's the same way in the Commonwealth. There's common laws that bind <coughs> the Commonwealth, a common language, as well as a lot of international development is done between this network. So this is really important to grasp. So the UN every year releases um, a tier uh, assessment of different countries. So you can think in the past it was more first, second, third world countries, but that language is long gone. Now we call it developed, developing, least developed. So this is usually classified based on GDP. Uh, those living under $2 a day are mostly classified under least developed countries. But I just want to highlight Actually, last month, uh, the Gambia seceded from the Commonwealth, but before that, there was 54 uh, Commonwealth countries. Out of those 54, only four are considered developed by the UN. So there's a lot of disparity in infrastructure, money, resources, even within the Commonwealth. And the CTO, we are a service industry. We provide these uh, services for policy to these Commonwealth members. So not every country within the Commonwealth is part of the CTO network. Um, each country has to pay roughly uh, 20,000 British pounds to utilize our services, but that's significantly cheaper than the ITU, which uh, Rachel's going to present on today. Um, so one of the things that I really enjoyed about working with the CTO is our international workforce. We had a lot of people that came from all over the world, all over the Commonwealth, we're not all featured here, we're on in our casual attire because we uh, were doing a team building day, but really it was a lovely um, group of people to work with and I learned a lot and I felt like I traveled the world through the CTO. Uh, so what is the role of policy in ICTD? Well, uh, this is a picture of the British Parliament and the House of Lords, it's kind of joined. But I was sent here my third day on the job which is pretty rare <laughs> for a foreigner, so it's a, definitely a wonderful highlight. And what it was was a conversation about policy matters, how to implement education in different African developing countries with mobile phone technology. So um, think about the role of policy in general in the US, uh, going back to our healthcare system right now. Policy definitely affects a lot of people on all levels in industry, technology, and the individual. So uh, the same is true for ICTD. It uh, puts on what is the agenda, where funding's gonna come from, what demographic, what social issue you're going to work on 
and it affects all tiers and levels of society. So it's pretty important, but we don't always um, have the best uh, interpretation of policymakers. Um, so what exactly did I do at the CTO? Well, I worked within the research and consultancy department as a research officer. Um, within this department, RNC, we advise government policy with, within our six different sectors to all levels of society, mostly on the macro level though, um, develop, different development partners, ministries, and regulators within governments, <coughs> uh, NGOs, and various industries. Okay, so this was uh, the RNC team. It was a wonderful. Uh, the gentleman on the left, his name is Kojo. He was born in Ghana, raised in London. And my colleague on the right, Fergani, he uh, is from Cameroon. So I really learned a lot from these two. They have a lot of policy experience. And I also learned a lot about Sub-Sahara Africa. So I did a lot within the CTO of my time there this summer, over three months. But one thing that I really focused on were uh, data indicators. So these data indicators uh, assess these different countries and help determine what the agenda is, where the funding will come from, just like uh, educational institutionalized tests are in this country. You know? uh, so what I looked at was broadband within each country. What does that look like? How many internet users per commonwealth country? Um, what does the SIM card penetration and 3G percentage look like and how does how does this compare within the Commonwealth? Um, I also looked at cell phone subscriptions within each country, fixed telephone lines, which are actually declining as the mobile broadband and cell phone markets go up. I also looked at price baskets, so how much does technology actually cost compared to other goods within the country? So this was fascinating stuff, and I love the data, but some people this is not their fancy, so that's okay. Um, so I'll briefly, briefly go into this. This is worldwide, not just the Commonwealth, how many internet users on the three different tiers of developed, developing, least developed. So many different researchers, they look at this and they see, oh, there's you know, pretty much an equal disparity, but it's an upward trend, an upward climb, which is pretty typical. So Professor Tim Unwin wanted me to research this specifically as well as this chart. Now this is the cell phone subscription per 100. Uh, I don't think mobile technology is the future, I think it's now. Um, if you look from 2000 to 2012, there is a significant rapid climb between the developing countries all the way up to develop. So the poor are catching up to the rich, hooray! <laughs> so a lot of uh, people are looking at this right there. But what Professor Unwin wanted me to focus on is this disparity here. So as the poor are increasing, the poorest are growing in disparity, and we call that the digital divide. So the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization tries to figure out what policies would best help all areas um, in this, in between uh, develop, developing, least developed. So what do we do with these data indicators? Uh, well, actually, we give them away for free. <laughs> They're open to the public. Uh, anyone can access them. Uh, but this is actually kind of controversial. So when I was um, researching all this data, uh, all these data, um, uh, I only got it from non-proprietary -propri sources. A lot of people have this information, but you have to pay a lot of money to get it. Um, and the reason also goes into broadband. Why? Is this information you know, so valuable? And why is free broadband a controversial topic? Well, think about the cell phone that you have. Think about the data plan you pay for and how expensive that is, and multiply that by how many people live in this country. There's a lot of money to be had. If I was really smart, I'd go into investment banking in the telecom industry, because <laughs> I make a lot of money. <laughs> but um, so it is controversial, and these policymakers are trying to figure this out. Is it a human right to have access to information, just like clean water or sanitation? So this, again, was in the House of Lords. I'm with uh, Professor Tim Unwin. He's you know, debating um, with these different policymakers as well over topics like this. So highlights and recommendations. I just want to highlight that 
Um, I did get to work with Professor Tim Unwin, and he signed my book. And uh, the last week that I was there, he invited me over to dinner with his wife. It was just a lovely time because I know he's such a busy man. Um, but I also want to provide some recommendations for those in the audience that will do their practicum soon <laughs> and what I learned from that. So I just want to highlight uh, that London is a wonderful place for expanding strategic networking within ICCD. There's a lot of people, a lot of important people in London, New York, and Geneva. So I just wanted to highlight, oh, and DTC. But London is a special place. This was just the people that worked within the CTO network. So the darker countries are, there were more employees from that area. We actually had six interns from China, so that's why China is so dark. Um, but I made a promise to myself that each week in London, um, outside of work hours, I would meet with someone face to face or go to a strategic uh, networking opportunity. Just within two months time, I was there for three months, I expanded my strategic network to this. So I learned a lot from these uh, individuals and I made a lot of connections in Africa. Which, you know, I don't know that many Africans here, but Joe, you're one of them. So yeah, I mean, they're just, you know, we're further away from Africa than London is from Africa. Short-term impact, I definitely brought my skill sets and uh, that I've learned here in the program, uh, a new wave of energy to the CTO. I'm posing here at a GSMA event in London with uh, Carly on the left. She uh, is the event coordinator for the CTO, and I brought her to some of these networking events that she didn't know about. Also, Srini, who's our social media guru, I brought my uh, expertise in social media and helped advise some of these policies that we have for implementing this and expanding the CTO. Long-term impact, I did a lot of research that is open to the public. It also helped with our capacity training and consultancy to these different uh, Commonwealth countries in the long term. Uh, so I had to take a selfie to prove that I was there, I wasn't the CTO, um, and I did learn a lot of things in the process. These are a few of them. Um, the biggest thing that you can't learn in a textbook is how the flow of policy works. So I really learned what that looks like. Also, how to obtain those uh, consultancy contracts, those big paying contracts. So a lot of that was learning how to write expressions of interest and requests for proposals. I also sharpened my qualitative and quantitative skills. And um, I gained a new level of professionalism in London, and I really learned how to market myself within the ICCD sector. So I would definitely recommend this uh, practicum to other people interested in the future. Okay, I'm just gonna highlight that I was pretty nervous going into the CTO. I didn't think I had the necessary skill sets for the job, but I could tell you that was a lie. <laughs> um, this program definitely equips you for any practicum that you need, and I just wanna highlight that. Um, and it also creates a wonderful foundation to grow and learn, and we truly do have a wonderful program that is well known around the world uh, for its academic uh, readiness for the field. I'm gonna skip this, but I don't have time. Um, I just wanna say what's next on my journey. Well, I've done the field work, I've done the policy, um, I've done the tech development within the program. Now I wanna get my feet wet in industry. I have an interview with Cisco tomorrow and another interview with Thomson Reuters on Friday. I'm also dabbling into social entrepreneurship. I want to find alternative revenue streams to the foundation I fell in love with in Mexico. Uh, also, if you're looking to hire someone in the audience, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to thank everyone for coming. And yes, I brought uh, Abby and Roche with me to London. So <laughs> thank you very much.
assume that no other easy alternative as opposed to computers would be available to us at this very moment? I definitely think that uh, mobile phones are the future. They are much, much cheaper than computers. I'm trying to go back to that slide that went up with there before Matt disconnects, but um, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe just one clarifying question about that slide. Yeah, it would be if it was mobile broadband or if it's connected cellular. Right, so this is uh, feature phones. Actually, a lot of the proprietary data that I couldn't get my hands on was about smartphones and mobile broadband. Uh, GSMA is a wonderful organization and they have uh, amazing stats, but I just couldn't get my hands on it, actually. We have, we have to pay a lot of money. Um, but yeah, I think that mobile phones are much cheaper than computers. Also, a lot of people don't utilize all the functionalities on a computer. Um, so tablets are the new move in the U.S. because, you know, someone might just want to check their email and social media. They don't need the capacity that a computer hard drive has. So a lot, of, um, a lot of people in these developing countries, all they can afford is a feature phone and are still doing amazing things with those phones. Yeah, we definitely look at that. I mean, Tim, uh, Professor Unwin, he was uh, saying that you know he has 15 different SIM cards. So these are definitely indicators that we looked at, and that's definitely skewed, and uh, that skews the data. And we're uh, right now a general consensus consensus in the field between researchers is how do we actually measure how many people are using cell phones as opposed to how many SIM cards, you know? So. Whenever you were on the slide before, you had asked the question, is access to information a right? And I was wondering how you felt about that and where would you be on that? Okay, so uh, there are studies that show that the faster penetra broadband penetration you have, actually the country's GDP goes up a certain percentage point. So I feel that if, um, personally, I feel that if governments invest in infrastructure, mobile broadband for the country and figure out how to implement this between different regulators in a way that bypasses government corruption, I think that we would see a tremendous benefit for these developing, these developed countries. Is it possible that I think you could argue that to one level, uh, but people are fascinating because they figure out ways to bypass it and utilize technology as a tool. Um, many developing countries in Africa I know are more oral-based cultures, so they could use the, um, the phone as a phone, <laughs> or uh, I mean there's a lot of researchers here with the PhD program that are trying to figure out how you can use uh, smiley faces to mean one thing or dash another, so there's a lot you can do. Um, so at one level, yes, at another level, I think it, it's a tool. Yeah. Last question, anyone else? So access is definitely important, but I'm curious if there's any measurements on how technology is being utilized to see this, not just access, but how it's being used. So at the macro level, you definitely get just more numbers, and you have to make more assumptions about what the numbers mean. And I think that's where field work is really important, where you go in um, and you find out how people are using technology in meaningful ways to them. So both are needed, policy, industry, and field work. Thank you. Do you want? I just wanted to stretch for you. Sorry? I just wanted to see the less, uh, less house lighting on the slides. Like that? It would be great, thanks.
Hello, and thank you for attending the fall 2013 practicum presentations. Uh, my name is Matthew Hulse, and with the support of the Atlas MSICTD program, I was able to spend this last summer in Washington, D.C. as a researcher for the World Bank. Uh, most photos in this presentation are part of the World Bank Group's Image Bank, which are free for one-time use applications. Some slide graphics were created by the team I worked with over the summer, and there are lots of beautiful photos available on their Flickr page, which is actually really useful to use in your presentations. The World Bank Group is a vital source of financial and technical assistance to developing countries around the world. The group is composed of several organizations, including the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the International Finance Commission, the IFC, and the IBRD, which is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which hosted me over the summer. The World Bank Group has two goals to achieve by 2030. The first is to end extreme poverty. They measure this by decreasing the percentage of people that are living on less than $1.25 a day to no more than 3%, again by 2030. The second is to promote shared prosperity, which is done by fostering the income growth of the bottom 40% for every country. This is a statue in the bank's atrium uh, championing the fight against river blindness, which is perhaps one of the greatest international development success stories. Uh, I worked in this building with the Transport, Water, and Information and Communication Technology subgroup of the IBRD. I supported projects in a variety of countries, aiding in telecommunications, software infrastructure, energy, and technology for change initiatives. Uh, my work was primarily reviewing assessment reports and preparing technical briefs, as well as providing solution support, and all while conducting my own research on how technology can support energy efficiency initiatives. Uh, while I did not travel to those countries listed before, I contributed on a variety of topics that addressed issues within them, uh, specifically in open hardware, 3D fabrication and fabrication labs in developing communities that can be used to provide hardware support at low cost and localized solutions to meet the hardware challenges. Digital commerce in, in the Caribbean, there's an ongoing project that's working with digital access portals to reduce corruption and facilitate trade between member states that I did some business review for. Uh, electronic identification systems, there's some e-voting and digital access to services in health and welfare in India that we were doing a lot of conferencing and marketing materials preparation for. And um, within the country of Nigeria, I worked with the Mining and Energy Ministry to create data transparency between some data portals they had so that resources could be shared across ministries. More closer to my research passions, I worked a lot in smart infrastructure the Barcelona Smart City Innovation Hub and the Smart Rwanda Project, preparing both um, conference materials and distribution of assessment reports about some of those projects. Uh, with my colleagues on some cybersecurity issues, reviewing um, threat models and specific to the energy grid and the connectivity technology, how that can both serve and protect critical infrastructure services. And I have these last two sort of italicized here. This is kind of what I want to talk a little bit more about today, ICT for energy and technology for change. These are overarching initiatives that serve every area of global development that I want to talk a little bit more about. So what is technology for change? In May 2013, the World Bank president, Jim Young Kim, that's him, was touring Central Africa promoting a new partnership with the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. They were pledging that both of their organizations will work closely together to bring the fruits of prosperity to the world in that region. JYK, that's what we call him, he was, he was quoted as saying, we need to do things differently. And uh, in summary, this is the driving philosophy behind the tech for change concept. How do we use technology to do things differently? I want to show you how information and communication technology enables global development through my eyes as I saw at the World Bank. Uh, we'll look at a high level of policy initiatives and I will link that to my research area which is technology for addressing energy access and poverty. So starting from the top, here we see the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. How many of you have seen these before? Raise your hand. All right, yeah. So these goals are meant to shape the global development agenda and pair with the World Bank's mission to end extreme poverty and promote shared prosperity, again, the mission. While none of these specifically speak to the advancement or dissemination of technology, uh, practitioners like us know that it is implied through the development of new or novel uses of existing systems, such as engineering new infrastructure or perhaps the creation of new medicines. ICT for D, 
has straddled these goals, serving in multiple capacities, such as increasing access or as a measurement tool for assessing impact. Okay, how many of you have seen these before? Raise your hand. So this year, the post-2015 development agenda was set out to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030, again, a World Bank goal, and deliver on the promise of sustainable development. These new goals drive five big transformational shifts, uh, leave no one behind, moving from reducing poverty to ending extreme poverty, sustainable development, which includes climate change and environmental degradation concerns, diversified economies, equal opportunities for all, especially young people, uh, and fostering better and more healthy consumption and production patterns. Open and accountable institutions, people over the world expect that their governments should be honest and accountable and responsive to their needs. At the bank, we called this open government work, and ICT helped to serve that, as well as the mass collaboration, which is forging a new global partnership centered around all kinds of people, especially those impacted by poverty uh, and exclusion, women, the youth, aged, disabled persons, or indigenous populations. So in this agenda, the role of ICT is a little more easily apparent. Here, our field graduates from an ancillary supporting component to the agenda's core infrastructure, social networks, the creation of communities of practice, enabling data proliferation and transparency, and especially providing connectivity, can now become a pillar of achieving this post-2015 agenda in our road to 2030. The rate of change and the impact of potential ICT, of the potential of ICT is apparent through some connectivity statistics. So in nearly 30 years, we've seen almost 7 billion mobile subscriptions worldwide. Through the work of multinational carriers and communication markets and connectivity initiatives, approximately 75% of the world has access to a mobile device. These stats make that ICT pillar that I teased on the earlier slide of future global development agendas both important and foundational. And mobile connectivity is just one factor. Remember that my work is in smart infrastructure. So mobile, mobile phones are not the only devices that are connected to the internet. While there are nearly 7 billion mobile subscriptions, we can project significantly more growth in just device connectivity. GPS on buses and trucks, cars with technologies like OnStar, or even your home audio player are coming online and getting connected to the internet. Within the realm of energy, devices like smart electricity meters, I'll be calling them smart meters, connect your home to the net and are a pivotal tool for connecting energy and ICT efficiency initiatives. You can have your smart meter at home, send your mobile device where your energy usage statistics are, which can um, better control your usage of energy. Uh, energy access is increasingly seen as a vital catalyst for wider social development, which includes better health and education. Rapid, rapid urbanization across the developing world will affect energy use and efforts to increase energy access. When we talk about energy and development, people commonly bring up these topics, uh, renewable energy like solar, hydro, and sustainable fuel sources, the smart grid of device connectivity, the intelligent utilization of source supply and demand and having the utility grid manage itself. H how many of you have heard of this third one, demand side management? Okay, so this is the social science smart grid which is where we encourage consumers, the demand side, to manage their own consumption. If every consumer of electricity can be convinced to reduce their demand, utilities will not have to supply as much, and we will have a worldwide reduction in energy demand. A smart meter in your home can report your energy usage statistics to your mobile device in a clean and informative fashion and connect you to the knowledge of how much you are spending on energy and when you're spending and how you can reduce your consumption which will save you money and others around the world. So I work to pilot those kinds of initiatives in the renewable energy grids uh, that are being created all over the world. So I believe that supporting universal access to reliable modern energy is a priority, as does the World Bank. Economic growth is essential for poverty reduction, and it is not possible without adequate energy. Economic growth cannot build shared prosperity like the bank wants, while 1.2 billion people are without access to electricity. Let's also not forget for some of my colleagues in EDC that there's 2.8 billion people without access to modern cooking facilities, which is also an energy concern. So these are the five core policy drivers within the Sustainable Energy for All initiative that I worked with a little bit over the summer. 
expanding renewable energy at some of those sources like I talked about, focusing on the poor and the bottom 40%, promoting some of that shared prosperity, accelerating efficiency gains like through some of the technologies such as smart meters, saving on energy efficiency means we do not have to build for the capacity and the production, uh, creating an enabling environment. This is a core policy area through lawmakers and capacity building initiatives so that we can build an environment where we can achieve a sustainable energy future. And I, also, we want to advocate for intensifying the global advocacy or the awareness of how critical energy is. Take uh, the example of the smart meter again. It's not just connectivity to your home or your mobile device, but being connected to the internet means it's also connected to your utility. That utility has an operation center, which can make real-time decision-making on the energy loads, the demands, and what the community is using on that grid. So this data center can conduct analysis, such as heat waves, and trying to maximize demand and take advantage of renewable energy and cut down on non-renewable energies. That data, that data center, is a concept of ICT in that it's big data. It requires the analysis of some of the work of our colleagues in computer science and in electrical and computer engineering, which is um, big data analysis with cloud computing and distributed computing and distributed analysis. There's a data revolution in energy. The fact that we have all these digital meters coming online means we'll be collecting a lot more data about how the world uses their energy. And through the, the framework of ICT, we're able to learn more about that and help achieve the sustainable energy initiative. Um, so, so ICT can play a big role in that. And actually, just like how ICT plays a role in the global framework of the post-2015 agendas, ICT in my mind and in the bank's mind is also playing a role in achieving the sustainable energy for all initiatives. Now, how do we enable technology for change? And how do we foster the infrastructure that's needed to connect like the smart meter example? The pace of technology change in the energy sector is very dynamic. Uh, what, what do we actually do? So beyond some of that high level work I introduced earlier, the World Bank brings people together through collaboration events, hackathons, conferences, building communities of practice, connecting the mayors, the engineers, the field workers, the technicians that work on both energy and ICT. The reports and strategies generated by supranationals like the World Bank guide the policies that we've seen to use technology for change and have an impact. And the financial assistance strategies and the capacity building initiatives lead entire nations to implement their sustainable energy future. Beyond technology and energy, the role of large organizations like the World Bank, they serve to pull governments onto this innovation curve. It's a place where both science and technology leaders are already innovating, and we need to get governments to bring their communities on board so that we can realize these technologies around. So I believe that if we can accomplish bringing the governments on board and working with organizations like the bank, then we can change societies. So thank you for your time. Yes, nice. yes, sir. So I believe in sort of that the smart grid 2.0, the demand side management. If we can empower the people who use electricity uh, with the knowledge of what they're using and what that cost is, then that's the first step in letting people make their own decisions. And I'm still an optimist, which I think that giving the people the, the knowledge and the ability to make a choice, where can I buy my energy from? The smart grid is not just about information. It's also about connectivity of resources. So right now, you buy on your last mile connection from an organization like Excel Energy. And with the information that becomes available and the data of energy, you may now be empowered to make choices and advocate for buying more reliable, renewable energy or more reliable energy or when you want it. And if you have a business and if your business priorities are different from your residential priorities, then, then that's what connectivity and the share, sharing of that data and knowledge should hope to enable. And I hope I can answer your questions.
Uh, my background before I even started in this program was in, um, in yeah, please. Sorry. My background before I even started this program was in uh, embedded systems, where I worked a lot on power control systems that were controlled through through digital devices for both the aerospace industry and in, in devices like your phone. And um, I realized that uh, it was very interesting to me about how both analog power could be better controlled through digital technologies. And I really care about connectivity also and networks and sharing. And sort of from my base framework in knowing a lot about energy and power systems and embedded systems, through what I've learned about connectivity and the power that we can create through change, uh, I merged those two and I sort of identified energy as the, the development agenda that I want to own and contribute. Very much so. I think um, there was an entire section of my group that was focused on open government and open data, and specifically of getting that data out into the medium so that communities and the electorate of their countries could be shared with that data and know what services are available to them. It's, it's not just about knowing the statistics or the census data of your bracket, it's also about knowing where is there you know, socialized health care that's available to you or free education and things like that. And I believe that while data from one level is just census information, from a second level it's empowerment of having access and knowing what's happening in the communities around you in the world. And I think the bank advocates for that too. More questions? Um, so I spent some time working on cybersecurity initiatives too, which is, from a, a quick summary of that is, as we connect more and more critical infrastructure to the internet and that's how our people connect to it, obviously there are more vectors for attack. And deciding the security model that needs to be built around how to protect that critical infrastructure so that people don't get harmed is a big challenge. And I know there are engineers working on it. I'm very concerned with it too. Um, so I don't deny that it's a risk and it can happen. But I still believe that it will help bring up societies and try to build equality. And I think that that effort should counteract you know, the philosophy of trying to attack critical infrastructure services. Thanks very much. Thank you. Excuse me. I just want to make sure that you talk into the microphone. Are you going to be here? Yes, right here. Do you need that space there, or? You can put this here. I'll okay. That Super. Thank you. All right, our last presentation tonight, Rachel Powers. All right, hi everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I hope you're all very excited for cupcakes afterwards as well. Um, so I had the great opportunity uh, over the summer and part of the fall to work at the International Telecommunication Union. And they have, uh, the headquarters is in Geneva. They also have an office in New York. But I was in Switzerland for four months. Um, and I'd love to tell you about what I did there. So for those of you who don't know, the ITU is a union of members. It's the specialized UN agency for ICTs. And it's mandated by the members. And that means there's uh, national members, so like states, the US is a member, Switzerland is a member, Rwanda is a member. There's also sector members, so Microsoft, IBM, and academic members, or the academia members. It's divided into four groups, ITUR, which is radio communications. It deals with spectrum management. ITUT deals with standardization, making sure things are interoperable, it deals with Bluetooth, that type of thing, um, gives recommendations, and also ITUD, which is the development sector. Where I worked was actually sort of the fourth not sector, but area of ITU, which is a general secretariat, dealing with all the sort of internal things, um, dealing with membership, uh, and specifically cross-sectoral projects, which is where I worked during my time at ITU. So within the general secretariat, I worked in a place called the Corporate Strategy Division. And during my time there, I worked on two different projects. First, the Global Consultation on ICT's Disability and Development, and then beyond 2015 Global Youth Summit, which happened uh, in Costa Rica. 
So for the first part, I'd like to talk about the consultation on disability and development. Um, this was a global consultation that ITU undertook with, its, uh, with a number of multi-stakeholder partners. And it was to address the issue of disability and how ICTs can be used, how they're currently used and how they can be used in the future to promote disability inclusive development. So how to include persons with disabilities in social and economic activities. And this was prepared specifically for the high level meeting on disability and development, which I'll explain on the next slide. And my role during this project was a junior policy analyst. So the high level meeting on disability and development, which I will be calling the HLMDD, uh, took place at the end of September this year. And it was a meeting of UN member states um, and observers and representatives from different areas. And it was all to talk about and address this issue of disability, the issue of persons with disabilities being included in social and economic activities, um, and how to include that in the post-2015 development agenda. One of the most important aspects of this meeting is that it would result in an outcome document to provide recommendations to members on how to move forward with inclusive development. So for me, this meeting was really important for three reasons. First of all, it brought global attention to the fact that persons with disabilities and the issue of disability was completely left out of the Millennium Development Goals. It wasn't written in there anywhere. Secondly, um, this outcome document from the HLMDD provides a framework for how to shape the post-2015 development agenda, how to address disability in the agenda moving forward, and as particularly when it was left out the first time around. And third, particularly because I'm interested in ICTDs, the HLMDD outcome document offers an opportunity to highlight the role that ICTs can play moving forward in the post-2015 framework. All right, so the UN General Assembly solicited inputs from all of different UN agencies, and the ITU responded by starting a global consultation on ICT's disability and development. Uh, they partnered with a number of other stakeholders um, from different uh, sectors, so you see Microsoft there, you have the International Disability Alliance, you have UNESCO. So it was, it was, the idea was that we'd have stakeholders from a, a variety of backgrounds to make sure that was, this was a well-rounded effort. Um, the idea behind the consultation was that we are going to uh, gather inputs from experts from around the world to investigate how ICTs are currently being used to promote the inclusion of persons with disabilities, identify the barriers and risks that are involved with leveraging ICTs for inclusive development, and also to recommend the way forward for stakeholders and propose indicators for how to measure success to see if the post-2015 agenda is actually uh, if it will actually succeed in, in being inclusive. So as a junior policy analyst, um, I came in right at the time when the, all, the, all the surveys and, uh, and the people had been contacted, um, the survey had been designed, so my, I came in right when we were gathering the input, when they were sending all the input back. Um, it was my job to help analyze and synthesize the data to start actually writing the report that would be the deliverable from this consultation, and then uh, coordinate with experts to peer review the report before we released it. Furthermore, I also was tasked with helping to promote the role of ICTs during the HLMDD preparatory process. And this is particularly important because although the outcome document is finalized at the HLMDD, it's drafted over a period of months before the meeting, and all the language is put in place many, many weeks beforehand. Um, and so if you have something that you want to make sure shows up in the outcome document, you have to be advocating it for, for it earlier. So um, people from ITU met with representatives, they attended meetings, provided input, pretty much to, to highlight ICTs as a tool and try and get it put into the outcome document. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we got from the consultation and the, the findings that we we synthesized from the data. So from the consultation, we had 150 expert inputs. This is from all different backgrounds, including from all different parts of the world. So in developing and developed countries, this is sort of a map, shows you a little bit of where these inputs come from. And as you can see here, they come from a number of governments, um, private sector, international orgs. So we, the idea was to make sure that this was uh, 
very interdisciplinary in, in where it drew from. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the methodology, but we used a couple of different formats for the survey. Um, this was significant because there are persons with disabilities who were um, asked to provide input and they couldn't use something like Survey Gizmo, which is usually a pretty cool tool for people to use, um, but it wasn't accessible. So we had a Word document that we made accessible that persons with disabilities, um, specifically uh, sight disability, can, can use screen readers for and respond. So now I'll talk a little bit about what we found. So in terms of the climate right now, of how ICTs are being used, we found that websites were the number one um, most impactful technology for persons with disabilities, followed by mobile device and services, TV set and services, and radio. And the areas that we looked at, the social and economic activities that we looked at, were these right here. And also, um, we divided education into, into primary, secondary, tertiary, and lifelong education. So although these are the overall most impactful ICTs, I also do want to mention that, for instance, independent living was most impacted by mobile device and services. Um, and that was really interesting to think about, you know, how, how, device, how mobile devices are helping people live independent lives, both persons without disability and with disabilities. Um, and for instance, TV set and services was very highly ranked for primary education. So that's still a tool that, um, that persons with disabilities going through primary education are using. So I also mentioned that we were going to look at the barriers um, to success. Cost was a big barrier, not being able to um, have money to uh, spend on accessible ICTs. Accessibility itself was an issue. Sure, there's a lot of technology out there, but how much of it is actually accessible? How much of it provides features um, where you can change the colors on the screen, do a screen reader, you know, where you have alt text for images? And then the third uh, barrier was policy and policy implementation. Um, and that means that there's a lack of policies in government that foster widespread availability of ICTs and lack of effective implementation that makes sure these policies are, are actually happening. The risk that we gathered from the consultation was, um, first of all, level of expectation. So this idea that you can throw technology at something and it'll all of a sudden be better. Um, that's definitely a risk of trying to leverage ICTs for any sort of development. Um, and so that was highlighted in the consultation. The idea of widening the digital divide, I think most of the people in the audience here have heard about the digital divide before, knowing that um, people who have ICTs, we, we saw on Rachel's graph how that is, uh, you know, in the developed and developing countries and the least developed countries, that gap is sort of widening. And if we're using ICTs to solve a problem, we wouldn't want that gap to get even wider. Uh, thirdly, the pace of technological change. So even if we had all the technology in the world right now, if we made it accessible, there's still new technology coming out all the time. And how do we ensure that the new technology that's coming out on the market has, has things implemented in it where persons with disabilities can actually use it? Um, so one of the most important parts of this report was uh, the recommended actions for stakeholders. And this is action-oriented recommendations. So we looked at a number of different stakeholders, um, the UN government, DPO's private sector, DPO's as organizations of persons with disabilities, um, and through the consultation identified a number of actions that each stakeholder can take to, to try and move forward with, with an inclusive um, development. So for instance, government uh, procurement policies, that means that when governments are soliciting technology for, for offices, for whatever that they have accessibility features as a requirement for the technology. That helps change the market, helps make accessibi accessibility features more built in, and that ends up helping everyone in the long run. Um, also for DPO's training, uh, even if people have access to technology, how do they use it? So we emphasize that both persons with disabilities and caretakers of persons with disabilities should be able to be trained on how to use ICTs and how to use ICTs to better uh, their lives. These are the two other stakeholders that we looked at that I couldn't quite fit on the slide. So uh, the report that I mentioned from this consultation is called the ICT Opportunity for a Disability Inclusive Framework. As we printed them in this very lovely bright pink color. Um, I don't know if this was part of the intention, but because it was so bright, it was easy to see which delegates sort of had it and were looking at it. So this report was distributed at the HLMDD 
two delegates. Um, there was sort of like a soft launch cocktail event where they, they got it and they got to talk about it, and then also a high-level um, side event at the HLMDD, which, uh, you know, it was brought up and more attention was brought to this idea of ICTs for development. And you can come look at this, too, if you, if you want to. My name's in there. Um, <laughs> but I have to get it back because it's my only copy. Yeah. Uh, so, what happened with this with this report? Um, the HLMDD, HLMDD document was this document that we were trying to influence, and it actually came out that there is two strong provisions on ICTs. The first one um, is about universal design to, uh, approach and making sure that accessibility is in place for assistive and ICT devices. So that was really awesome that it was mentioned there. And secondly, the mobilization of public and private resources to facilitate access to uh, and sharing accessible and assistive technologies. So this was really exciting. Like I said, it was sort of an iterative process uh, during the HLMDD uh, preparatory time, but to have this finally be an outcome document was really exciting. And what that means is that the outcome document from the HLMDD will then go on to influence the larger post-2015 development framework, and hopefully ICTs will also be mentioned in there in regards to persons with, persons with disabilities. Um, after the report was released, I, I was doing some other promotion. Um, I, I presented on the report at two different times during ITU internal meetings, attended a World Health Organization plan. Um, th they were drafting their disability plan. We talked about the report there. Um, I helped provide material for international conferences and provided a lot of material for online. And if you're interested, this is where you can access the report online. Okay, part two is shorter. It's about my time uh, doing the Global Youth Summit. And I've had kind of a couple of different roles during this time. I help with the program, I help with the delegates that were attending the conference, and I helped with app testing. So this event was an international youth summit that wanted to highlight um, ICTs in the context of youth trying to create change in their communities. So we, it looked at a couple of different, um, well, yeah, so it's youth and ICTs and development. It looked at a couple of different theme areas, um, entrepreneurship, online protection, respecting your environment, um, being healthy, and the idea was that youth can use ICTs to affect change, particularly in the post-2015 development agenda, and that's why it's called Beyond 2015. The participation for this event happened three different ways. There was online crowdsourcing, where people could log on online, post ideas on how technology can be used to address problems, um, and then people can sort of vote with each other or comment. Uh, and this was a new thing that ITU was taking on. They hadn't done this sort of crowdsourcing before. There was remote participation through coordinated hubs, so if people from a certain area weren't able to attend and they couldn't get online, they could come to a physical hub in their city or at their university and um, participate with other youth and talk about these topics. And then, of course, in-person attendance. So um, during program design, the, we wanted to make sure we had a lot of activities that were engaging for youth. Um, ideally, those activities should feature youth prominently in the program as the speakers, as the sort of um, organizers. Uh, we wanted this event to be for youth, by youth, and I too was interested in making sure that it stays relevant by bringing in the younger generation. The challenge with that was when sponsors give a lot of money to something, they kind of expect to be able to speak about their pet project or what their company does, and so a lot of time that person wasn't youth, that person was an older person who, you know, has done a lot of these things before and, and maybe wasn't the right, uh, ready for the, a youth audience. Uh, additionally, I too wanted to get a little bit away from the bureaucratic tone that uh, is at most of its other events, and uh, so it was a little, a little challenging for that. We ended up with a lot of cool stuff though, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, as a delegate liaison, I did a lot of uh, engaging with missions uh, in Geneva, coordinating with different offices around the world, um, writing and organizing different communications for the event, and um, making sure that people actually got to the event. So helping with visas, that was really challenging. Uh, as an app tester, there was three different apps that we were using for the event. We ended up using two of them, Numwalk, which is a pedometer of, uh, app, and then the overall summit app. And uh, there were some challenges with that. Everyone got a tablet. 
at the event, which is pretty cool, except when you realize that the, or the accelerometer on the tablet doesn't work so well, so you can't actually do the pedometer app on that. You have to use, ask people to use their cell phones, but it only works on Droid, so if they have an Apple phone, they can't use it. So that was a little complicated. Um, and the last thing I did was I actually got to go to Costa Rica to um, help with the event there, and that, so I was there pretty much doing whatever they needed me to do, but mostly it was um, uh, session coordination. I was helping update the app because there was a lot of things that were changing during the day. Um, I was running one of the competitions, the one I just talked about with the pedometer. I had to tell people that they couldn't do it if they had a, an iPhone. Um, and then there was an outcome document that, that came, out of the, um, came out of the summit that was about youth and their vision for the post-2015 world. So here's me working in ITU. That woman in the top left corner is Doreen Bogdan. She is sort of like my boss's 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 boss. And she was one of the few Americans that I met at ITU, and she's pretty cool. I mean, they're all cool, but you know. Um, it was a lot of hard work, and it was really tiring. So we're all very happy. We, it was, we felt very successful when it ended, and then I got to spend a couple days at the beach. So that was nice. It was a nice reward. So I want to thank everyone here at Atlas, um, specifically these people, and also um, the team at ITU that I worked with. It was a really awesome experience, and I hope everyone gets to do something as enriching during their practicums and during their lives if you don't do practicums. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I, I don't think accessibility can, um, accessibility doesn't take away disability. It just helps people um, participate in the relevant activities while they have the disability. So disability is, um, we worked a lot with some of the people at the um, UNHCR um, and they, or sorry, the human rights group at, in the, from the UN. And they were talking about how disability is a this social construct. So a person with a disability, a disability is how they are viewed by their community or by the world. And so, like, I wear contacts, so I have a slight, you know, visual disability. Um, but that, because I have the technology in contacts to sort of facilitate my participation, it doesn't become an issue, right, or becomes less of an issue. So I think the idea of using technology is that disability will still exist. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's decreasing at all. Um, I would assume that with vaccinations and stuff, it is decreasing during the world. Um, you know, polio vaccine means that less people have polio now. Um, but I think that the real interesting part there is, is that disability sort of evens the playing field between people and, and allows persons with disabilities to participate on the same level that other, other people do. Um, if I have to guess, I would guess that the Millennium and Development Goals were kind of like this new thing that no one had done before. And so, I mean, I know it was professionals and people thought of experience doing this, but they were kind of taking a crack at it when it hadn't been done. Um, so I think probably a lot of stuff got left out. Uh, I do think that the voice of persons with disabilities has increased tremendously over the past um, over the past 15 years, and so I think that sort of movement has highlighted the fact that it was left out. There might be other things that were also left out where it hasn't gained as much um, sort of traction. That would be my guess. I mean, thank goodness it got caught, right? 
Yeah. But, and you're right, like cover some slack. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Which issue that they decided to work on in their community like interested you the most? Like, what rose to the top for you in terms of what they were interested in working on? Um, you know, I I wish that I had been more involved with actually working with the youth. Yeah. Um, yeah. My role in that in that event was more on the organizational side, um, but there was I I met with a guy from Columbia who was actually working. When I was emailing with him, I thought he was like an older guy who was trying to come to the thing, and I was like, "It's really for youth." Like, and then, and then, like later on, I'm like, "Okay, you're 23." Like, yes, the definition of youth, our definition of youth was the UN definition 18 to 25, and so I was like, "Yeah, yeah, come, like it'll be great." And he was working with the Colombian Ministry on um, on two different projects. One was uh, for uh, keeping children safe online, and that actually was an issue that sort of rose to the top during the event as uh, something that people my age were really interested in, which I found a bit surprising. Um, so there was a lot of youth that were interested in how to keep children safe. Uh, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're going to wrap up. Can I have all three of you come? Well, three of you come back up and join? Uh, all right. So they I just want to show them the off list. for a minute because they're so great. So. Damn, one even wrote a book. Um, so what, what I think is really impressive is just how much field work you, you had going into this and the fact that you all three chose policy positions and then in, in were able to really increase your sphere of influence from just the community level you know, to the global level. And uh, you know, Rachel's, um, you know, Rachel Strobel's presentation highlighted ITU data. The ITU data highlighted the post, you know, <laughs> Okay, so you know, the, the, the post twenty the post twenty fifteen framework. So I really think this is kind of indicative of ICTs as as a way of really merging a lot of things together. It really is a lot of the glue that holds the pieces of development together. Not only is it you know a form in itself of societal change, it is a way of making societal and organizational change. So proud of you guys. Thank you so much. Thank Graduate. You. All right.